Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Everybody wearing different clothes than you did a week ago? <laughs> yeah, we, we all had a good time. By the way, those uh, connection cards you just uh, heard about, uh, last week we had a couple people share some answers to prayer through the connection card. And it was so encouraging to uh, see those uh, because we invest in those prayers. And it's great to hear the stories of what God is doing in your life. Uh, we're continuing on in the series, What's Good for Your Soul? And this morning I'd like to look at two passages, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And the first one is in Numbers chapter 6. And it says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. And then in Romans, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 9, it says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. We all have to do things we would prefer not to do. The phrase I use for that is adulting. We just have to do adult stuff. How many here, in the last month, you've had to do something you would have rather someone else do? And I don't know what the rest of you are doing. <laughs> God bless you. You figured something out we haven't figured out. I mean, just certain cleaning responsibilities, certain maintenance responsibility. If you have a little child at home and you have to change a diaper, there comes a point at which that's no longer a joyous occasion. Applause is not happening. You're, you're starting to change your opinion about this. Uh, shoveling snow in bitter cold. How many just love doing that? You know, there might be a couple of people, but by and large, we do it because we have to. And then there are times that we do things that are necessary for the health and the well-being of another person. It's not just the maintenance of property or uh, a task, but something that we have to do to help someone else. For example, I remember going in when our children were very small and they were going into the pediatrician and it was one of those shot appointments and, and they would ask me to, to hold my child while they give them the shot. And I always felt bad about that. Like, like the, the child would look at me and, and think, you partnered with them to bring injury to me. Like, I thought I could trust you. Um, or uh, maybe we have to restrain a person from getting into a dangerous situation. If you've ever had to do that, it, it's, it's hard. Or intervening when someone is attempting their own life. I've done that a couple of times. And uh, it's hard. It's hard because of the actions that are needed in that moment, but also in the sense that they look at you with, as though you're betraying them in some way. And those are hard. There's also other situations that aren't just hard or difficult, but they seem to cause some kind of injury inside of us when we do it. Uh, there's a term that's... Uh, uh, used more commonly these days, and it's called moral injury. It seems as though that there are times when a person engages in an action that violates their conscience, it violates their ethics, it violates their values, it violates their morals, and they can't just leave it behind. It's like something inside of them was torn. Uh, there are times when a person witnesses or fails to prevent an action that really caused significant 
consequence on someone else. And their conscience just, conscience just won't let that go. And it feels like something got injured on the inside. There may be times when there's something that you could do that would have made a difference, but you didn't do what you could have done to help another person. And it's like there was a little tear on the inside. And it, it's something that goes deeper than regret. It's not like it's just a missed opportunity. Oh, I could have had that car or that house. It, it's not like, it's not just regret over that was a stupid action or a selfish action that I took. It's something that seems to go deeper and it doesn't get better on its own. A decade after the fact, the wound may in fact be deeper and feel fresher than the day you received it. So what is going on there? Something of an internal code has been broken and it lingers and it haunts us and it exhausts us in life. There's obvious examples of this that I can give. Uh, if you are in the military, and you are required to be engaged in combat and required to use deadly force, uh, that can really cause this kind of soul injury, especially if in the use of de deadly force against an enemy combatant, there was an innocent civilian nearby who got caught in some kind of crossfire and was injured. If you've ever given direction to someone and then something catastrophic happened in their life, feels like something inside has torn. Uh, failing to report sexual assault or rape committed against oneself or against another, feels like something inside gets torn. Following orders that you knew at the time you were doing it, it was wrong, and you did it anyway. Uh, these things just linger internally. And there's less obvious examples. Like those are the ones that we all agree, that, that's a thing. But you can be a really overworked healthcare provider who can't exercise all the options that they would like to exercise in the help of someone that they're trying to bring back to health. Sometimes there's even organizational restraints placed on them. These are things that they know would be good for the person, but they, they're not allowed the option to do it. And it's like something inside gets a little bit torn. Now, not speaking up when a family member or a friend who is being abused and we, we could at least speak up. It may not stop it, but at least someone would know we would think that was wrong. And when we don't do that, because we're afraid of some kind of retaliation, something inside of us tears. Remaining silent when improper actions are being taken by others, maybe in an organization, for fear that it will cost us our job or, or something of retaliation there. There's this kind of injury that occurs to the soul. And sometimes it can manifest in physical ways. This isn't just an internal battle. It starts affecting our body. It can inhibit our capacity to live a full and healthy life. Soul wounds go deep. And the impact can be far more than we imagine. It's common for these wounds to actually go deeper over time rather than heal. When people say time heals all wounds, time heals a lot of things but not soul wounds. It takes something other than time to fix that. We were not just created to survive the events of our lives, and we're not created just to be witnesses of the events of our lives. We were created to do something more and something deeper in our lives and with our lives. There is more to us than just our appetites or our physical needs. There's a lot more going on than that. And scripture gives us insight about this. Scripture indicates that we have souls. It's invisible, but it's an internal part of us, and it's incredibly complex, and it's eternal, and there's something going on there. And to ignore it doesn't make it any less impactful or necessary in our lives. We're a lot more than just our desires. We have a capacity, according to the verses we looked at today, we have a capacity to bless each other. And we have a capacity to curse each other. And I could be wrong, but it feels to me like the cursing side of that equation has been a little elevated in recent days. We have this capacity given to us by God. Somebody says, well, 
I don't really bless people and I don't really curse people. And this isn't about how you use specific words, though it can include that. But every interaction that we have with someone either has a positive influence on them or a negative influence on them. We certainly have all experienced what it's like to be on the receiving end of negative influence from someone else's actions. And we could take a half hour just describing how we feel and how it influenced and impacted our lives. There's a really interesting story in, in the very first book of the Bible. It's in chapter 27. There's an old man who's getting ready to die. His name is Isaac, and he has two sons. The oldest son is Esau, who's something of a, a, a sports guy. He, he likes to go out and hunt, and, and he's good at it. And he's got another son whose name is Jacob, and Jacob likes to hang around the house and, and do other things. And so this father actually favors the older son. And, and he knows he's about to die, and he actually tells his older son, he says, I want you to go out and I want you to shoot the game that I really enjoy and I want you to prepare it the way that I enjoy and I want you to serve it to me and then I'm going to bless you from my soul. And Jacob overheard this conversation and Jacob desperately wanted to be the one that would receive the blessing. We, we have this capacity to bless, but we also have a craving to be blessed. And Jacob knows there is no way his father is going to say these words to him. So he pretends to be his brother. His father's very old. He's lost most of his eyesight. His hearing's not all that good. He's about ready to die. So he puts on his brother's clothing. He puts some stuff. His, his brother was very hairy, so he's put some stuff on his arm to feel like it's hairy. And, and he makes sure he smells like his brother. I'm not sure all that that means, but can't be good. I don't think they had cologne back then. And, and so they, so they, he, he goes in and he, pre, he prepares something and make it taste like what his older brother would bring in. And, and the dad's a little confused. He said, are, are you sure you're, you're Esau? He said, yes, I'm, I'm Esau. He says, come here. And he smells him. Well, it smells like Esau. And, and, and he feels, it. well, you're hairy. Like, well, I guess it's Esau. And, and he's, he says the words to Jacob that Jacob has waited all of his life to hear. Question, have you ever pretended to be someone you're not to hear words you desperately want to hear? And here's the problem, that when we do that, when we know we're pretending in order to hear the words, we don't believe the words when they're spoken to us. We know that because there was some measure of deception involved, this can't actually be true. Uh, by the way, this craving for blessing that Jacob have doesn't just have happen in this interaction. You can fast forward into another season of his life, and he winds up through a weird series of events where he's wrestling with an angel. And uh, this wrestling match goes on all night long. The angel's really just playing with him. He could dismantle this guy in a heartbeat. With a single move of his hand, he actually dislocated his hip. I've never had a dislocated hip, but I believe that's got to hurt. And Jacob, even though his hip is dislocated, refuses to let go. He's fighting for his life, and he's hanging on for his life. And this is what he keeps yelling. I will not let you go until you bless me. We will pretend and we will fight to hear the words we desperately need to hear. Explains a lot of what's going on in our world, doesn't it? Humans really haven't changed all that much. Our technology is superior, and thank God they invented cologne. But no, we haven't changed all that much. This explains some of the behavior that we see in our world. So. We can tell when someone is actually blessing us and we can tell when someone is cursing us. How many can tell when you're being cursed? <laughs> uh, and by the way, cursing is not just swearing at someone or casting some evil spell on them. Uh, for example, by and large, because of technology, we're more aware of injustice when it occurs in our world. And in our world, People don't just want to see things made right. They want the people who did wrong to be cursed. 
And they'll use language that way. It, it's more than a person or an institution paying back or making right. Something else has to be done, and it has to be a curse. And that curse has to, has to disable and, 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 and bring pain in such a way that we assume that when other people see that, then they won't do the same injustice. You are made to receive blessing, and you are made to release blessing. That's what we have been given by God the capacity to do. But we don't do it. Why? Well, one of the reasons is we often don't feel good enough or worthy enough to be giving blessings out. Like, I assume if you're the, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, like, I think everybody just agrees that guy can bless anybody. Right? You just assume so. When, when a person holds a high enough stature in any religious organization, you just assume the capacity to bless. But, but Scripture does not indicate that our capacity to bless is determined by a title or other people's willingness to recognize our capacity. It's this innate ability given to us by God that we can use our words and our actions in such a way that we build other people up unto their internal purposes instead of tearing them down. It's quite a remarkable thing. The other reason is that we often feel like we don't have time because blessing does take a little time. So, so the passage we looked at gave us some phrases. How do we bless others? The Lord bless you. What does that mean? It means I am willing to partner with God to make sure that good things happen in your life. And here's how we struggle about this. We may th look at someone and think, I'm not sure they deserve the good things of God in their life. And our assumption is that if I do bless someone that I think is undeserving, that I'll have that little moral injury. That's not where the injury occurs. You were made to bless, and when we refuse to bless, that's when a little injury occurs to our soul. A lot of us have these self-inflicted wounds where we had the opportunity to command the blessing of God into another's life and because we withheld, something inside of us knew that wasn't quite right. A lot of times we're so worried that someone is going to interpret our actions of blessing as an approval of some behavior that they're involved in and that if we, if we do that, they won't change. So let me just ask you a question. It's rhetorical. You don't actually have to answer it, but just think about it. Do you think a person is more likely to change their behavior for a God they think has good plans for them or change their behavior for a God who's just out to punish them? I think we need to think about that a little bit. Um, the Lord keep you. What does that mean? I want the Lord to protect you. I want the Lord to preserve you. I want the Lord to preserve what is sacred and what is eternal and his purpose in your life. There's an example of Joseph. Uh, uh, Joseph was one of, of uh, a lot of brothers. There were 12 of them in all. And uh, uh, they did not like him. They were jealous of him. There were reasons for that. I don't have time to go into now. But they colluded together and they sold him into slavery. And then things even got worse from that. He went out of slavery and into prison. And things didn't go so well. But what's fascinating in the telling of that story is how often it says, and God was with him. And even though bad things are happening to him, God is preserving his purpose. And there comes a moment in his life when his brothers and his family are at risk of not surviving because of a famine that is crossing the land. And they show up and they don't recognize Joseph because he's been living in Egypt and his clothes looks different and his language is different and they don't recognize him. They haven't seen him in a long time. And Joseph in that moment can exact punishment or that Joseph in that moment can provide for their needs and he chooses to provide. And this is what he says, what you did, you intended to harm me, but God intended this for good. The purpose of God was preserved even through the difficult things in, that, in Joseph's life. How many want God's purpose in your life to be preserved even if you have to go through a difficult time? Is that not a good thing? It really is. So he was actually able to, to bless them. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. There's an expression that we use when, when we see someone and, and, and we say this, that their face lit right up. Now, does, does that mean that their face actually lit up? 
Was there a light that began to emanate from them? No, but it's the expression that we use to describe the fact that they were really happy to see us. There was a smile that came across their face, and in some ways it felt like it brightened. Uh, there's an expression in scripture that says the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord actually refers to not just the reputation of God. It actually refers to two components, and one has to do with light. The, the lightning, the, the, the glory of the Lord kind of cast a light, but it also has weight. It's another meaning of the word glory. What, what does that mean? There's actually a really interesting story. I think it's in 2 Chronicles 5 where they're dedicating the temple and the priests are going in. It's, it's, it, this is the first time they're doing a religious service. And it says that the glory of the Lord was so great that they couldn't, they couldn't carry out their ministerial responsibilities and, and they had to leave the space. What was happening? There was such brightness and there was such a weight that came down. Kids get this, right? If you've had a kid, you've, you've tried to... to to distract them with little toy keys. Have you ever done that? Little plastic things. They never want them. But if you give them real keys, they like them. Why? Because they weigh more. They can tell this is real. That other stuff, that's fake stuff. Real keys also have sharp edges, and for whatever reason, children are attracted to those things. But why, why does this matter? Well, it matters because God has not come to lead us into or leave us in darkness. And God has not come to lead us into or leave us in a life that doesn't matter. There's a kind of weight and an imprint you are intended to have because of the working of God in your life. And when we don't bless, we leave that out. We walk around like plastic keys in the hands of toddlers when we could have the keys that open the kingdom of God to people's lives. What a difference that is. What a difference that is. You are not a lightweight. God has brought you in the world to make a serious impression and a serious imprint in the world around you. And the Lord turned his face towards you. This has to do with giving full attention. It's being present with. God is not ignoring you. God has not forgotten you. God has not forsaken you. We can remind people of that such a powerful thing to do. And when we do that, the presence of God begins to interpret our circumstances rather than allowing our circumstances to interpret the presence of God. Makes a huge difference. And give you peace. And give you peace. Peace is not just the absence of, of motivation or hopes, like, a, well, I just, I gave up on everything, so now I'm at peace. No, that's not the same thing at all. Peace is the ability to trust that God is conspiring to bring good into your life through every event, every interaction, every day. And this is what scripture tells us, that our present troubles are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul gives the information to the church about how we can do this really well because he says that we are created to bless and we need to be careful to even bring blessing to those who persecute us. How do we do that? Love is what makes our words and our actions more sincere. Love is more than a feeling. It's a commitment to I want what's best for that other person and I will continue to say and act in that way. He says, never lacking in zeal that I will continue to stoke a passion in my life to make sure that the goodness of God is known and transferred to other people's lives. To be joyful. No one really believes when you're, that you are blessing when you've got an ornery look on your face. I don't recommend you try it, but some of you already know this. If you just look at somebody, God bless you. <laughs> They're not going to believe that. Patience, because blessing can take a while to unfold in a person's life. Faithful. You can review a blessing you released in your own prayers. You remember how God used you to bless someone, and then when you think about them, you recall that back, and, and you go, you, pr you include that in your prayer. It's a very powerful thing. Bless even those who persecute you. Don't get sucked into the curse mentality of our world. Oh, don't get me wrong. You'll get a lot more hits on social media if you curse. 
you can go viral, just like an infection. That's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to bless. Bless when no one notices. Tone, language, body posture, all of this matters. So this is how I want to end our time together today. I'm going to ask worship team to come up. And I'm going to...